some of the other uh, motives. You know, it's not just us and ADC that were looking at this and saying, geez, this makes sense uh, for maintaining these uh, supply path and return uh, path delta Ts or managing a, uh, an entire airflow management system in a data center. These are some of the other organizations around uh, you know, Green Grid, LBNL, uh, Intel, have, have all written some level of a white paper around the benefits of this uh, to an HVAC system and how you can actually drive efficiency. This is a lot of the impetus behind uh, the development of the concept for what they wanted for their data center and why containment was an integral part of realizing that concept. So again, what were they looking for? Uh, historically, there's a lot of trade-off going on around data center flexibility with the IT manager looking and ideally wanting that flexibility, which in this application is the customer now, versus uh, the cooling performance, which is the facility owner or the colo provider. So it's, you know, you, you've got that uh, push and pull from each side. And what they needed to do is really give the uh, customer for, for their application <laughs> the ability to support any vendor IT rack. They didn't want to reject the customer in a co-location because their equipment was already racked up and it was a size or type of rack that wouldn't facilitate their containment system. So it had to handle any uh, vendor IT rack of any height or depth. Uh, now as, you, as you think about that, trying to have a mechanical system to be able to mate up to the, to the rack, that can be a, a pretty good size challenge. Ability to support density anywhere in the, in the data center. As long as you maintain an overall cap of the data center as far as its uh, megawatt level capability, you should be able to move that density around in the data center. I mean, they didn't want to have to say, this is only where you'll put your high density stuff, this will only be where you put your medium density, and this is only where you put your low density. They wanted to be able to have that flexibility within clients and within the data center to put that high density uh, anywhere in the data center, as long as they maintain their overall cap. And then uh, they, they didn't want to take up any of the rentable space with uh, HVAC equipment. So they wanted the entire white space fully available. Right? Not, not an unrealistic uh, set of requests uh, coming from what would be the customer advocate. And then of course, add moves and changes. Everybody knows uh, that you can look at a data center and you can take a snapshot in time and that's static. But a data center is seldom in a static state. It's a dynamic animal. It constantly changes. There's, there's ad moves and changes every day going on in the data center, and how do you handle that? They didn't want to have to limit their client uh, by, uh, by having an intensely managed ad moves and change. Give them the capability to do that. And that change, by the way, can be at the U level or at the rack level. I mean, they can have the ability to roll out one rack, roll in a whole other rack, and not lose containment integrity. Of course, on the uh, performance side, they wanted to keep this green uh, and uh, you know, obtain all their pre-certs for a lead platinum level. So to be able to do that, they needed you know, the greenest possible HVAC system they could come up with. Why? Well, an efficient cooling system, number one, has less to operate. And let's face it, no one's really going to adopt a green uh, unless it's actually saving them real money. Uh, optimize the design that can match supply with demand because obviously a new facility has a build cycle then has uh, clients move in and out over its life. They don't want to have to throw in 100% of everything and leave it on all the time. They wanted it to be able to ramp up and down, match supply with demand. Uh, and then obviously predictable, predictability in the dynamic mode. That was really important to them because pre through predictability, you drive reliability. And obviously that's very important in a data center. So in the end, a lot of these cooling performance features can really uh, coexist in <clears throat> giving all that flexibility back to the, uh, what would be the end user or the, uh, or the consumer. So in the end, we wound up setting this collaboration course. This is what they, they charged us with go ahead and, uh, and make something. So we, we obviously decided uh, to uh, take it uh, pretty seriously. Uh, we put together an entire collaboration uh, life cycle. A lot of what you just talked about, what we just talked about was building that business case. What are we trying to do? What, are we, what problem are we trying to solve? 
uh, and then uh, go through a whole uh, planning and uh, initial procurement, build a prototype, launch the alpha version, uh, and then get feedback for, for refinement. This is approximately the, the cycle time that it took to develop this product. Uh, and just so everybody knows, this product is, uh, is here today. We brought a, a version of it sitting out on the uh, Avcom floor. You'll be able to take a look at it when the show opens later. But that just gives you an idea of what the collaboration cycle is like with uh, Rightline. Now, <clears throat> agreed, not all uh, collaboration cycles are, uh, are equal. This one had the luxury of time. Uh, we can do it in shorter cycle, but this one had the luxury of time, so that actually was beneficial to uh, the entire project. Uh, had an end user, highly knowledgeable of what they were looking for. They weren't looking for a black box. They were very laser specific on what they needed to do, and they were focused on obtaining those goals. So, uh, you know, we were, we were able to work well together uh, and uh, really launch the, uh, the whole collaboration effort uh, quite seamlessly. Then we got into uh, the first phase of uh, actually producing something viable, which was some of the concept drawings. This is just some of the first versions that we're uh, putting together on a means to uh, capture all that heat. Uh, and then you know, some of the other features as it uh, progressed further, as you can see the variety of different cabinets mating up to this type of system, the amount of airflow uh, that we had to be able to evacuate. And of course, this whole system needed to be able to grow on demand. So we were able to uh, uh, facilitate that with a lot of these different concept designs as we started to get more refinement. We started to need to see the need for uh, you know, immediate available growth. So you can see a lot of blank spots. Those are actually full width uh, rack size blanking panels. You know, rather than the one U blanking panel, this is one that fits an entire rack. You can take that out, roll up a next rack, and you're off and running fully contained, return integrity within about 45 seconds. So pretty quick changeover. You can also add chimneys if you decide you needed to have uh, additional density. If you wanted to add chimneys after the fact, you can actually populate as much uh, uh, exhaust as you want. And you know, these, these exhausts can be uh, active or they can be passive, depending on the type of system. Uh, this one actually turned out to be uh, passive. Uh, and of course, fully populated with chimneys and uh, in a variety of cabinets. And then of course, when you wanted to grow, you need to be able to continue to grow. One of the uh, requirements for the growth was zero waste. I mean, they didn't want to have to throw something away of what they had already bought uh, to be able to grow. So the challenge was put on us to say, all right, we needed to have a method uh, to make growth relatively easily. And as this, you can see the two green extension uh, frame, we basically just cut the whole facade off one end, extend the frame out, and now just populate it. So it, what was, the door that was on one end is reused, uh, that'll be the door that you always use and just make the aisle as long as you need it to be. Uh, and you can grow in whatever segments that you really need to. Uh, and then populate with additional um, ceiling structures, whether it be chimneys or, or clear chimneys, doesn't really matter. And then now you've got plenty of uh, growth to continue on. This was the first prototype. This product, uh, is actually sitting on the West Coast right now. This was uh, the first version where we've uh, actually uh, met the uh, requirements. One of the unique things about this uh, structure and this client is they actually have a very high ceiling. And when you're in a high bay facility, you have a couple other options and a couple other constraints. One of those has to, happens to be uh, oh, you know, wireways and wire tray. If it's 30 feet to the uh, ceiling deck, you don't want to actually have to have 20-something feet of threaded rod holding uh, a piece of wire tray. That gets a little bit unrealistic in a large facility. So you, you can see some outriggers there that can actually hold uh, a wire tray. So all the power and data cables can be supported by the structure as well. Uh, this one happened to be uh, uh, clear chimneys. As you can see, the uh, chimney structure reaching up to the what would be the first point of a drop ceiling for that return. Uh, and end of row doors, and uh, you get a little glimpse of the uh, vertical blanking now. Uh, that, was, uh, that was the first prototype. Some of the things that we advanced, moving on, this is uh, uh, more of the final product after that feedback stage that we sat with the client, uh, showed them what we had, uh, had designed, and then uh, started uh, making the production-ready ones. 